just got to remember cord to the cloud, right? All right. First off, we just want to welcome everyone. Um, and um, first, just because we're a small group, um, what kind of our welcome or idea that we thought we would start with is I think everyone knows everybody in the room, so we probably don't need to do name and district. But I want you to think back to your own education and what is a favorite memory of yours of a, if you want to quote unquote, say favorite teacher. So a favorite memory of a teacher that you have, and maybe it's influenced you in your life. And I'll give you just a few few seconds to kind of process. I see some smiles on faces, which is so fun to see when you. And I am going to throw, Brenda, when you are ready, you are going to start us, but you do not start us until you're ready. And then you can pass it around. I'm ready. I'll share the first thing I thought of when you said favorite teacher. It's always going to be Mrs. Anderson, my fourth grade teacher. And the thing that I love that she did is every day when we came in from recess, it sounds really basic, but she read aloud to us and she read us tales of a fourth grade nothing. And I don't know, she was just one of my first experiences with really like great chapter books that got my attention. And here was Mrs. Anderson reading it to us. And she'd laugh, you know, when it was funny along with us. And she was just a very warm and caring person. So that time just felt so family-like to me. So I love that. And I'm going to pass it on to Jody. I love this question because um, I always say that my absolute favorite teacher was Miss Hardy. And I felt, and I don't, at the time I always said like, it's because she made what we were learning about re real. We learned, I lived in small town, North Dakota. We didn't know what a pomegranate was. Like our grocery store did not have those things, but like she found a pomegranate because we were reading about a pomegranate. And, um, but I, recently I was going through some things. Um, my mother had a tub to get out of my house, out of her house. And in there, after she left, I just really adored her. I found postcards from her that she wrote. I found a little address book that she had given me that she put her address in so I could write to her. So even after she left my school, she, I still had that connection with her. And I would love to just believe it was just special for me. But I'm when, I think she probably had that connection with all of our students, but she kept that connection with our lives. And I think that that was so huge. And I'm going to send it to Anna. Okay, it's weird. Cause I have the same thing with Brenda. It was my third grade teacher and her name was Miss Fawnen and she would read out loud to us. And I remember her reading little house on the prairie. And that was like, I just loved that book. And then that just kind of started this lifelong love of reading. And it started with the little house on the prairie series. And um, yeah, she was a really neat lady. I've tried to find her like on Facebook and stuff like that, but I'm sure she got married, but I just haven't had any, um, or I haven't had any luck finding her. So I'd like to tell her sometime how much of an impact she had on my life. Lori. Okay, so you all went elementary. I'm going college. Um, I had, so my advisor, uh, his name was Tim Lewis. He recognized that in college, I was a kid who freshman and sophomore year, I really like went zero to a hundred and did really, really well and studied. And I think as I got a little bit older, got to junior year, I kind of just lost my way a little bit. And I remember him giving me these, um, and the fact that he trusted me with, he had these, um, they're like right in the rain book. So they're field journals because I was a biology major, ecology, and he had probably 20 to 25 field journals that he had collected data on white tailed deer. And I remember him asking me for a meeting and he brought them and entrusted me with this data that he had collected over so many years and didn't tell me what to do with it. Just said, here it is. And kind of, I think, opened that up to me to say, you know, I believe in you. I trust you. You know, can you make something out of this? So I just will never forget that. I think he saw me and I think he recognized that I needed that and, and you know, stepped up to make that happen. He had a lot of students and did need to do that. So. I think of that often. I appreciate that. Sherry, to me. Um, 
So it's really hard for me to pick a favorite teacher. Uh, I grew up in a K-12 building where my dad was the principal and my mom was a teacher. And so those people were family. So it's really hard for me because, um, uh, yeah. So, but some of the things that they did, um, Anna, when you talked about Little House on the Prairie, um, yes, um, them reading to us, I think was so impactful and just taking that time. And it's such a, we're doing some of those things right now with kids is giving them time to read or just be read to. And what a stress reliever that was. I was coming back from lunch. That's when they all read to us. And it just kind of gave us a start to our afternoon. So that's kind of a favorite piece I always remember. So, well, thank you all for sharing um, your memories I think today um, we are going to get into um, me, uh, talking about teacher credibility. And I'm just making sure, can everybody see my screen yet? Yes, no. Are you guys Not seeing sure. anything? Not yet? yet. No? Not yet. Okay. Sorry, I am having problems with buttons here. <laughs> Um, and it it's comes. there it comes. Okay. Um, like I couldn't even mute and unmute. So that was kind of not fun. All right. So today, um, we're going to get into what is teacher credibility and both, um, myself and Amy are going to present this. I kind of talked a little bit. We got into credibility and trust, um, earlier on in the year. And then we kind of dove down this idea of what is teacher credibility. So we're going to dive into that and learn more about that today. So um, what is teacher credibility and what does that look like in the classroom? So the perception that students have is that from the student side or the learner side, it is that I can learn from this adult. That is abs that they are believable and they can convince me that I can do what they're asking of me. And it's so funny, one of the big things that as we were kind of diving into this, like how, I don't know if you've ever been in a doctor's office and I hate to use this as an example, but I have been in a doctor's office quite a bit due to some medical issues for myself and then for my dad, but it's so funny how I tune someone out as soon as they're not credible and how learners do this exact same thing to us when they view that we're not credible. So it is such an amazing like topic to dive into is, okay, what makes me credible? Like, why, why am I tuning that doctor out? Okay, why is that student tuning me out? What does that look like? So why, why is that so important? So when we look at teacher credibility, we also know the effect size that it has. Um, it is more important than learner motivation and has twice the impact of socioeconomics. So when you put that data and that research up there, it is absolutely imperative that we dive into this and figure out, okay, what are the components? And as we're supporting our teachers who are supporting our learners, um, how do we, help them dive into this and know, okay, what is the piece that I'm missing? So as we dive into credibility, credibility actually, um, there's four parts to it. And it's trust, competence, dynamism, and immediacy. And I, I'm going to tell a story right now about Amy and I, but <laughs> we actually had to look up how to say dynamism because we weren't like, that is a word that I, do, I don't know if any of you use it in your vocab every day. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you do, because I I'm I will bow down to you right now. Um, and you can make the Google slide or the Google video or the YouTube video um, and replace the one that's out there because the one that's out there is a little creepy. Um, but these are the four components of credibility. And so we're gonna dive into each one and kind of talk about them and what do they look like? And I want you to, as we're kind of going through them, maybe reflect on that teacher you mentioned and see like where they fit in this. And I also, as we were going through this, I put myself in there and like, okay, where do, 
how do I do in these four categories? What does that look like upon reflection? So trust. Um, we know that trust is the basic foundation of so many things that we do in education. Learners need to know that their educators care and have their best interests at heart. And it has to not only be academically, but socially. And I think that's one thing that I think is really important that we need to make sure they know that we care about them, not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. So what does that look like? If you make a promise, you keep it. And if you can't keep it, you explain to them, give them the why of why you could not. If um, telling the students the truth about their performance, I think is absolutely um, critical. And of course, in the foundation of trust, yes, it, it is definitely important. Focus on the positive. So sit back and examine any negative feelings you might have about a specific learner and then figure out, okay, how do I get around that? Competence. So what does competence look like in credibility? So learners wanna know that we know our stuff and that we can effectively teach it. So what does that look like? Well, do I know my content well? Am I honest when I don't know something? Or if I make a mistake, do I come back around and say, hey, you know what, I, I messed up. Um, I didn't give you the correct date or I didn't give you the correct order of something or I didn't give you this. Um, have those conversations because it's also great modeling um, for students that they can too make mistakes and that's okay. Delivering information in an organized, cohesive and coherent way. And for each student, sometimes that looks a little bit different. And then also considering our nonverbals. Um, nonverbals can create barriers. And so taking a peek at those and looking at ourselves, and that's why sometimes recording can be an amazing thing because it will help us take a look at those nonverbals. All right, besides competence, we have that fun word dynamism, which I think is sad. I don't know what the word is because the word means so much. It is bringing that passion. It is bringing that enthusiasm for your content and not only for content, but about your learners, that you are enthusiastic about who they are. So how, what does that look like to a learner? Well, making our content interest, interesting and then considering the relevance of our lesson. Are we reaching them at their level? Are we making this fit into their world? And then also, this is a great one to get some feedback from some trusted colleagues. What, what does my energy look like? What does my delivery look like? And bringing those trusted colleagues in to give you some point, pointers, excuse me. Last but not least is immediacy. Is that moving around the room to share that you are accessible and relatable to learners. What this helps create for you is getting to know your learners, learning to teach with urgency, and using every minute within the classroom wisely. So as we look at those four components, I hope you maybe thought about that teacher that you have that memory. And my guess is they probably scored pretty well in those. And maybe you even saw um, pieces where you're like, oh yeah, they were really good there. Um, we're going to do a little reflection activity, and because we're a little bit smaller group, wondering if we are willing to be a little bit vulnerable. So the reflection activity has us, and you can just do this on a post-it or just kind of by yourself, we'll do some think time, but it takes those four components and has you kind of take 10 words um, and um, go ahead and record them and put them in each of the four categories. So, um, Amy, do you wanna do you wanna add anything to this before we keep going? Sorry, no, just gonna ask as she came in. Okay, sorry, she was looking for something. She just came back in here. So, 
So we will have you capture the essence of these characteristics in 10 words and put them on a post-it. And then I want you to think about once we're done with that, we're gonna think of the four aspects of teacher credibility and which one do you feel is the highest for you and which one might be an area of growth. So we'll give about three to four minutes of think time to do those 10 words. And then also we'll come back to the question of which of the four aspects of teacher credibility are highest for you and which one might be an area of growth. Okay. Is everybody at a, by show of thumbs up, is everybody at a good place where they'd be willing and able to share at this point? Okay. Who would like to start? Any volunteers that would like to start and maybe share some words that they wrote down? Does it matter which one? No, you get to pick. Is there a weakness or? <laughs> nope, you get to pick. Okay, Um, I'm going to say um, the first square was always doing what you say you will. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. Anyone else willing to share? So I'll be vulnerable and say that would be um, competence is a place where I struggle. And I think we struggle the word, the competence and feeling that you have to know everything and have all the answers where in first life learning, we want kids to know that we're there to guide them and learn with them. So I struggle to feel like people will respect and value me if I'm not always the person who has all the answers and doing all the things, right? I want to show that value. So I think that's an area of growth for me. Thank you for sharing, Lori, and thank you for being vulnerable. 
Lori, I'm going to build off of yours because I kind of wrote other words for each of these categories that I kind of associated with myself and for competence. I put lifelong learner because I feel like I'm always reaching to know more and be better, but I don't know that I would ever get to a point where I feel like I knew it all. all. So like the fact that I'm willing to learn and grow, I feel like in my mind supports that confidence. Um, one of when, the areas, oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I also had that learner's mindset piece on competence and, and thought about that, but it was the dynamism area that called to me the most, I think, especially when I think about, they stepped out of education for a decade and did it in a different way. Um, and then came back into a secondary level. And I think I struggled with this one a lot, just understanding like, to be engaging doesn't mean to be entertaining and to be, you know, to capture their attention and hold their interest isn't a show. It's, it's just a more subtle approach than that about the way that you bring them into learning. And so this would be the area that I would want to um, get more comfortable in. Yeah, for me, um, I think the area that I need to grow in um, is is competence and I can relate to a lot of what was said of um, I'm okay with not always knowing the answer. I, I'm good with that, but do I know enough to help support um, somebody else and um, and making making sure that I'm I'm leading them down the right path. Um, so I, I think that is how just the struggle of, of how do we keep learning things change so fast. Um, how, do, how do we stay on top of it all to ensure that we're supporting others in the best that we can? And I would piggyback off of that. That's kind of exactly where I'm at. How do I, how do I make sure I know enough um, to help others? So thank you all for being vulnerable and willing to share. Okay, I'm going to say one more thing. So, you know, when we think about a lot of us, we're in that confidence piece. Um, and that really comes down to trust, right? do we really trust that person that we're working with? Because I am making myself vulnerable, whether I, I um, know something or not, there's no way that anybody can ever know anything. And we are just, we have to have that relationship um, to be able to move the work forward, even as a supporter, um, because we have to have enough trust with that person to be vulnerable. Um, and I think they go back and forth and it is, it is so hard. It is so hard and so uncomfortable um, um, so I think that some of the, the pieces in this discussion that we've been having about trust and credibility is, is, um, is really critical. Okay. We're just going to be vulnerable here. Um, we have been having some major tech issues, like our mouse won't work, nothing will work. And so we're going to try pulling this back up again. You probably saw that we were doing this. So, um, you may see us, uh, fighting a little bit, um, to get this going. So I'm just going to talk. Yeah, so Amy's going to talk, gonna and I'm going to mess, I'm gonna okay? Talk. And we're going to look at each other for just a little bit. And wow, I didn't even plan this, but that was a beautiful transition into trust. So when we think about what is trust, um, uh, we have a quote here. And individuals, or trust is, an individuals or group's willingness to be vulnerable to another party based on the confidence that the latter party is benevolent, reliable, competent, honest, and open. That's a mouthful. I'm going to give you a minute just to read that again and just think about each of those parts. And then I want to give you a minute to respond uh, to what do you think um, about that definition. Was there a word that stood out to you that maybe you didn't think about before? Or do you think that that sums it up pretty well? I really like the definition. I, I think that it really sums up all parts of trust. 
and across a lot of different researchers. Um, I feel like a lot of the components are, are in there. So I really like that. And, um, you know, this definition at the bottom, we have acknowledges that we must be vulnerable if we are to develop trust and learn with others. I added that last part, but that's the critical part. We are all here to learn with each other. And so how do we build that trust? This is a really important piece because we wanna think about how does trust help build the sense of team and help build um, that collective knowledge. With collective knowledge, we build collective efficacy, responsibility, and accountability. And we start at that step one of collegiality, getting to know each other. This is not only just knowing um, a few little details about each other, but it's also knowing um, a little bit more, a little bit more about how that person works. And do I start to trust you enough to even collaborate? Um, so we're working side by side on the same thing, um, but we're maybe not, we're, so our work is mutual, but we aren't there yet to really know that our beliefs are the same and that we're really striving um, to work in that pathway together. But as that trust continues, um, and we view our colleagues as credible, that is when we can start digging into building that, that um, collective efficacy. So in essence, when we trust, it's easier to love our work because we feel productive in our work and we feel productive um, with our um, coworkers in those relationships. We are better with colleagues um, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel and that moves us to the collaboration cycle. And then our impact on learners is greater um, because we are have those same goals and we're working towards those same goals where we can start getting to collective efficacy. And I just like to remind people that we don't always get there. And every time somebody new joins our team, we step back because we always have to start at the foundation. We are running on time are running low on time, which is kind of what Sherry and I do, is we run um, low on time. So I just wanna share a couple little nuggets with you that we'd love for you to um, consider digging into a little bit more. And um, they will all be, um, they're obviously all in the slides. Um, so the first thing that we'd like you to think about is um, take a look, there are four kinds of people. There's the talker, the amplifier, the loner, and the independent contractor. Um, on your time, when you have a chance, I'd, I'd love for you to take a peek of those and where do you fit? Where do maybe your colleagues, colleagues fit? And I, I think that you could even relate this in a few different words to learners. Um, and it could help, help think about what, what you think you know about somebody um, and read a little bit more um, about what each of those mean. So the next following slides, again, um, because we're running out of time, we're going through this quickly. Once you find that category, it talks a little bit about each of those people. So the amplifier is um, high collective efficacy, high teacher credibility. The independent contractor, low collective efficacy and high teacher credibility. So um, those are all four defined um, on these slides. So take a look and think about how can how can this work help inspire you um, to help a team or a building culture um, move forward so that we can get that greatest impact for our learner? We have 30 seconds to give you to just think about what was one takeaway that you have from today or one takeaway that you would like to dig deeper into learning more about um, teacher credibility or trust and just throw that in the chat. This can help us know what was beneficial today, um, what we could consider sharing more about in the future. And while you're doing that, I just wanna take some time to share that we truly appreciate you joining on today um, to um, talk about trust and credibility and how those are used to build um, collective efficacy and why that's important. I apologize for running out of time. I hope the extra resources that we have in here will be beneficial um, to you and your teams. And if you have questions, we are always here um, to support and to answer in any way um, that we can. 
we don't know a lot of the answers, but we can point you in a direction. Um, that is that is half half the battle right there is knowing knowing where to find our resources. So thank you all for everything that you do. We're gonna just open up the floor if you have any questions, um, comments, wonderings um, before you have to jump off. All right, I think we can stop the recording then. And if you're listening, have a great night. Thank Girl. you. And Thank you. Amy and Sherry have some extra resources.